Hello everyone, and welcome to Andrew Broussard Watercolors. Today, we are going to play around with a two-color painting. Um, I used this painting combination yesterday, and I wanted to just go at it again. If you saw yesterday's video, you would know that the, um, the cats, the cat's desire to get into the art room reached almost a Lovecraftian type frenzy where they were meowing and scratching at the door. So me and the cats came to a compromise and that compromise is that I would cat proof the art room and allow them to come in when I paint. Yep, that's the compromise. But I think they just want to be in here and hang out and I guess, you know, the curiosity of the cat that's, you know, really holds true. All right, so today we have a quarter sheet of Stonehenge Aqua, 140 pound cold press. I just saturated with water. It is 100% cotton. I am going to use Cotman Lemon Yellow, and I'm going to use the Cotman, I'm not really sure how to pronounce this word, uh, Diazine Purple. So I'm going to use the combination of these two. This is pigment PV23, just in case you're looking at different brands. Now, being that these are complementary colors, you would think we would get some sort of brown, neutral, um, what have you. But these colors mix to a very beautiful combination that stands on its own. I'm going to get my Ron Ranson, the medium hake brush loaded with paint. And I'm going to talk about the method that I'm going to use. This method I adopted from some tonalist uh, oil painters. A very big proponent of the method is Stuart Davies. Stuart Davies has tons of free oil painting videos on YouTube. He also has a Patreon and he does, um, I think, Zoom meeting classes. And he's just a really fantastic painter. And what he does with the oil is he goes in with it, pushes it around, wipes it back, scrapes it back, dabs it in, and creates texture. We're going to do that with watercolor, where we're going to throw the paint in, we're going to wipe it back and forth, and uh, build up our texture and build up our tonal values. So, my idea for the landscape I'm not sure what I want yet. I'm not worried about splatters. I'm not worried about uh, brush marks just yet. I want to just come up with a composition. This method is really great for relaxing. It puts you in a, a fantastic mood. And the results, they're, I don't know if they could ever be negative. It's that fun. We'll leave the white of the paper in spots, and I think I'll pull out um, some highlights in the sky in a moment. Maybe we'll have a distant shoreline. We'll have our trees grouping and coming up towards us. The great thing about this is, despite the fact that it's watercolor, if you don't like what you're getting at, you can wipe it back. You can paint over what you have. Um, it's a very fast, loose, free-flowing painting. We'll let this edge come towards us. So we'll do a S-shaped composition right here. The interesting that thing that happens with this, I find, um, you may sometimes repeat compositions, which I don't know, I, I'm not a psychologist, but what does that say about you? You know, does it, um, do you have an S-shaped composition that repeats? Do you have mountains that repeat? Um, what is your ideal imaginary landscape? And you'll find, and I'm guilty of this, and I'm not sure if other artists will admit 
that they're guilty of it. But from the outside looking in, you'll see it. That sometimes their compositions will get a little bit repetitive. And I think that's because of a few factors. First and foremost, um, a lot of these are kind of practices and studies. And we're kind of just, uh, you know, limited by time and having fun with that. The other thing is that we are in the 20th century or the 21st century. What century are we in? But um, when we look back at past masters, we might be limited to what has you know carried over from what they did or from the painters in general. But nowadays, um, artists can post daily. We can see what they do. I mean, I post daily. So that repetition might be commonplace there. I think a variety of factors. So stretching the paper, I did blot out the sky right there. I thought about how maybe we could get an interesting light from the sky and then light on the water. But we may have to block that off from the eye going off the page. Other things that I repeat is having darker edges and it's just something that I I like compositionally darker corners and you'll develop your style and what you like you might adopt some of the things that I like you might say I don't like this but if we switch it here we can do that Just using the paper towel to lighten up these spots and get that distant effect. The striations in the sky, meaning the lines of pigment, I think I'll allow that to stay. I'll do some foreground trees that'll build up over that. Now keep in mind with this method, as you go back and forth, you are um, lifting water out and you can go back in with the hake brush and add water back into it. I have not dipped this hake brush in the water since the very beginning of this painting. Adding water to the brush will result in cauliflowering and other issues. And I say it as if it's a negative, but you may like that effect. So course you know, take everything with a grain of salt and adopt it to what fits you. Um, another watercolorist who goes very 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 loose in some of the beginning of his experiments is um, Mind of Watercolor. I think that's a huge watercolor channel. And it might have some stuff on it that you like where he'll saturate pour in pigment and let it float around on the surface and then create a design from it I think some he had some ideas going into he said but for the most part it's very loose I don't know if I mentioned it but he called them uh, spontaneous watercolor paintings We had a great video on um, gouache, the whites, comparing the different brands. And that helped me get an idea when I was getting my gouache, what I wanted to go with. Or at least what were some of the drawbacks of a brand or the positives of a brand. So I'm taking the number one rigger and I'm just putting in a little bit of wet and wet trees, slowly developing the scene. And I will say this, I placed an order today 
I needed to get more paper, so I'm running low on paper. But I did pick up a few other uh, cool things to experiment with. So once that comes in, I'll make a video about those products and see if you want to add it to your art tools. I, I try to take um, whenever people support the channel to put that back in and use it for experiments and just help the channel grow. I'm taking a thicker quantity with the number one rigger and I'm building up that shoreline. I think a little bit higher here. might help us create that S. See how I want it. While I do this, um, I usually give the spiel of you are always welcome to follow along with these paintings and uh, encourage you to. The tonalist fast and loose ones might be a little bit hard just because of um, the spontaneity of it. But try it out or find a color mix that you want to use and experiment with it. I can almost guarantee you'll have fun. But if you ever follow anything, you are more than welcome to sign your own name to the piece of art. And you have my express permission to sell anything that you do following one of my videos. I want you all to be successful and have fun. And art supplies can get a little pricey. I rarely ever watch any of my painting videos. I um, I try not to. I think I am more critical of hearing myself talk and things like that, as opposed to critical of any art that I do. The reason I am mentioning that just taking stronger concentration and going in with uh, the hake, building up this side. I don't like how triangular this mass is. So try to get a little variety up and down as we grow. Anyway, what I was thinking about was what do I repeat often in every video? I know I give the spiel but um, I don't know, do I um a lot? Do I say I don't know a lot? Do I say subsequently a lot? <laughs> Feel free to let me know in the comments what I say a lot. And I'll beat my mom to this one. I always mention my mom and how much I love her and that she watches these videos and supports me. <laughs> So, Mom, you can't comment that. No, but I have a lot of um, people that are supportive of the art and the channel. Either people I know personally from my life or people that you know I've met on the internet um, that, that are supportive of this. And I uh, am truly thankful of all those people. And I guess what I'm doing is trying to put myself out there as somebody to be supportive of you all learning how to paint or wanting to experiment with painting and art. And let you know that you can pick up a brush and paint and have fun. You might not like what you do, the results of it, but you'll grow, you'll have fun, you'll start learning why, and you'll start experimenting and changing things around. The one issue with this approach to painting is the quantity of pigment that is used, especially if one pigment overpowers the other. You probably have seen me put out 
the lemon yellow two times so far this one maybe three times it does use quite a bit hey percy are we using a lot of lemon yellow and um but if you're using cotton if you're using van gogh brand uh da vinci brand it's all reasonable i mentioned in the previous video that somebody had said in the comments the prices and the availability of uh, white knights in europe which um, seemed very good price wise so i think if you're in um, europe and have those available you get a tuber of Cotman, you get a tube of uh, Van Gogh or White Knights, and you're good to go. And if anybody ever wants to send any um, brands or paints for me to try, let me know. I will gladly accept anything and try anything. I like doing that aspect of a uh, channel, kind of talking about, I don't know, a, a product re review. It's, um, it's fun. I don't get to do it too often. I love exploring the uh, Noodler pigments, uh, paint, sorry, not pigments. Sorry, Noodler uh, inks, yeah, for the fountain pens. And they're amazing for art. And there's some that are light fast. And everyday wise, I almost exclusively use fountain pens, which may be kind of snobbish. I started using them and I really enjoy them. I really don't have a good handwriting and I felt like that helped and in fact about two years ago before the pandemic I started giving students in my um, class and a uh, high school teacher uh, fountain pens because they asked about the pens and I had some extra ones and I posted on reddit about it and people all over the world, like literally in America and from the United Kingdom, sent fountain pens for my students. They sent inks. Um, I teach in high school, so there's a lot of kids that you don't have or that were in different grades. And they came by asking about the pens and um, you know, I gave them out. And taught them how to refill a fountain pen, how to care for it. It was really, really cool. I had students who said it helped their handwriting. And I think um, they never had something like that. So I'm taking the card and scraping that edge. This is the cut sharp edge of the credit card. The rounded edge will more likely give a thicker line and pull more water out like that. Um, one thing I always talk about is you can get what's called what I call backfills where you scrape but then the pigment and the water falls back into it and it creates a dark line so you can get a variety of tonality and textures with the card itself these little hash marks or dash marks or if we wanted a little idea of growth and the tips of um, overhang of leaves. Just a lot of the time, these marks are more of the permanent side within the painting. You're often physically damaging the paper. So just uh, be aware or cognizant, I think that's a word that I say often on here, of the fact that you can, um, you'll have to deal with that later on if you want to paint over it. We can use the flatter edge for some nice rock effects. Joe Menza 
um, David Usher, Matthew Clemens, uh, who else? Uh, Stephen Cronin. I'll use that. It's a great effect. But when doing that, I find that it helps to ground the rock, just like you would ground a tree, by darkening that area around it, creating growth. I am just having so much fun with this painting. It was a pretty good day at work and a pretty good day coaching in the weight room. It was nice. I'm going to do a pause. We're going to dry off. I want you to pay attention to how things lighten up as it dries. You always want to be aware of the tonal shift that will take place. Okay, so we are dry enough. We did have a lightening take place. Um, different pigments will lighten to different effects. I uh, have found that darker pigments, uh, blacker pigments, such as uh, Payne's Gray, which is usually a mixture of a black and a blue, excuse me, will have quite a drying shift take place. So just be aware. And let me know in the comments what paint do you find shifts unbearably? Like which one are you just, oh, it just shifts way too much. Which paint do you find doesn't shift that much? For me, I found phthalo green and quinacridone rose mixture will have not too much of a drying shift. And I've also found that burnt umber doesn't have too much of an issue. Now with this mix, I'm gonna use the purple as a uh, dark replacement. I am trying to increase my pigment quantity be random with these marks. A little bit of those reflections down. I'll bring this over. Now the hake, it's gonna be fairly dry at this point. We haven't added any water to this brush since the beginning of the painting. So I used the initial wet and we haven't added any. Sometimes it's necessary to add a little bit at this point, but once you add a little bit to the hake, it really does affect the texture. So um, watch out for that. One issue that I had was that with using the purple as my dark, I needed to remember to change kind of the chroma, the color value or the mix of it. I'm not unfortunately up and up on the, um, the correct language, the saturation, go back and forth between lemon yellow and the dark purple to get the variety rather than just blob. Here's a whole bunch of purple. Trying to get my darker marks along the edge. The texture. Raise this corner up. More lemon yellow. And this texture over the soft, wet and wet will create interest and depth. You can go purely wet and wet and let it dry, but it may seem a little too ethereal 
feel free to experiment with that. Um, experiment with just wet and wet, dry it off, and and let it sit for a day or two. I take a picture of it and look at it and see how it feels. It gives a, um, like I said, uh, an ethereal type feel. It might give a hot summer type feel if you had uh, sand that was reflecting the heat back up and you had that haziness. You get some interesting effects. So I want to show you my water. We haven't cleaned the brush at all. And when I grab a little bit, I literally take the edge now and just grab a little bit of water to get things going again. And you see how we have that difference right off the bat um, where it's pretty much almost too watery. If you feel there's too much, you can pull out water with the paper towel. A few other points of interest is that uh, newer hake brushes, this one is three years old, and you can tell that it's been through a lot. Um, new hake brushes may not act in this fashion. So far, the only way that we've really found to get hake brushes like this is to really just um, use them. But when I say we, other hake users, um, people on the Ron Ranson uh, Disciple Facebook page, from time to time, will experiment with that or ask the question of it. But um, it really seems like use is what gets you to that point. We've compared a brand new hake brush, uh, Ron Ranson hake brush, to this one on this channel. And we are able to see the differences. Some people will wet their brush and trim it, brush against a harsh surface, try to pre-wear it. But the best advice that I can give you, unfortunately, is just grab your hake brush, use it, and have fun with it. If you can't get the same effect that I'm getting, that's understandable. You don't, you, you don't have the same exact brush as me. Um, you don't have the same, you're not the same mind as me, the same person as me. You're ultimately going to have the impact on how things act on the paper. At first you won't, You'll, you're gonna play around with water quantities. You're gonna feel frustrated and struggle with it, but that's all of the learning process. I feel like this area is lacking. I'm trying to think of what we can benefit from it. I also do feel like this mix, even though I love this two color combination, I'll need to find something that will truly help it darken. I'm gonna pause for a dry off and we'll see what we can do here. So I went the way of a more circular or a tunnel composition where we have the outside rounded area bringing the attention to the inside. I'm not the best with different compositions or naming them because there's like the L-shaped composition, there's the S, but here for me, it just seems so much like the open circle. And this one, I always struggle with, where we're coming in, and to me, what are we supposed to look at? So I thought, why not just have some fun, grab the number one rigger, as much pigment as we can, and we'll put in Saltwater fishing. Now a few watercolors. 
who have been putting in or put in amazing figures. Um, Ian Campbell is just absolutely phenomenal. He is on the Ron Ranson Facebook page that I mentioned. Uh, Ron Rans Disciples. Ron Ranson Disciples is the name of the page. And he'll have figures walking down paths and they're just really, really good. And uh, Lois Davidson has been putting in some phenomenal birds in her works. I mentioned uh, Stephen Cronin earlier. Stephen Cronin puts figures in his work. In fact, I believe he recently shared a piece on Facebook that he had for sale that had a gentleman fishing in the painting. I'm always trying to mention other artists and uh, people that have influenced me or inspired me or helped me along the way or are producing you know work and videos to help other people I'm trying to get a thin thin line for the fishing line oh, way too thick I don't know if Alan Owen puts figures in his paintings. I don't know if I've ever seen it. Okay, so we bring the eye out. We have our figure there. We can put some birds in the sky. have them come up so we're looking in they come up we explore around so we're past the 30 minute mark so in a minute I will do a dry off we'll sign it and we'll see how it looks underneath the mat While I was doing the dry off, I was thinking about some other people. Um, there's Colin Woodward in the group that has, there's Colin's dog that shows up in uh, paintings. There was uh, Lana's duck that people would uh, put into their paintings. So um, all those fun little things that you can add and really have fun with it. So here's the end result. I hope you enjoyed. Um, Please like, subscribe, follow, and um, please share your results with me. Please, and I will talk to you soon. Have a great day.